We're good, Mike. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Finney. I'm the president and CEO of the Miami-Dade Beacon Council. Uh, we're here in a third in a series of virtual town halls that's intended to share as much information as we can about the CARES Act and all the resources that are available to uh, members of our business community as well as individuals. We're excited to have with us uh, an outstanding group of partner organizations, in particular Miami-Dade County, uh, they have been and continue to be a key partner as this effort rolls out, both from in supporting the, the, the federal and state level, as well as in the local community. We also have supporting us today, uh, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, in addition to a number of business professionals with Holland and Knight and Cherry Becker. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mayor Carlos Jimenez, representing Miami-Dade County for some remarks. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, certainly a pleasure for me to be here uh, joining uh, everyone on this uh, Zoom conference. And uh, it's vitally important to us that all small businesses in Miami-Dade County take advantage of the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Plan uh, that it offers to a, a, such a large number of our residents here in, in our county. And so uh, Miami-Dade is, is here to to uh, help in any way uh, possible. I know, Mike, Michael, you've done a, a great job uh, in, uh, in putting this together, uh, along with everybody, all of our panelists, to give all the information that our small businesses, our very small businesses, and our 1099s need in order to take advantage of the CARES Act. And I'm asking everybody that, uh, that is listening to please, you know, uh, listen to what, uh, what's being said today, um, follow their, their advice, and, uh, and again, Miami-Dade County stands ready to help you in any way, shape, uh, or form. Had a pretty good meeting yesterday, a uh, pretty good uh, Zoom conference with uh, a number of the bank CEOs. And there are some issues that had, were um, kind of holding them back from uh, issuing some, some of the loans under this, uh, this act. But apparently the federal government has taken care of some of the issues that they had. It still is an issue of how you apply in the, in the, in the pipeline for the application process. The federal government apparently has opened up another pipeline for the applications to go through smoothly. But we also found out that the very small businesses and the 1099s are actually going to have a tougher time of this. And that's why we have, uh, you know, the Beacon Council has put this together to give you the guidance and hopefully get you all uh, in the pipeline so that you can get the money that uh, we deserve. Well, one thing I do not want to happen is that the rest of all the other states and all the other counties and all the other cities, you know, help their small businesses and 1099s to get, you know, get relief from this act. The money runs out and then here in Miami-Dade County, our people don't get that, that relief. And so that's why we're putting this all together. That's why I've actually been working with, uh, with the Beacon Council and other folks to try to get ahead of this curve so that Miami-Dade County is actually in the front and all of the businesses, all the people, all the employees here in Miami-Dade County can pay for it. Eventually we're gonna to have to pay for it and it would really, really be upsetting if we were paying for the benefit somewhere else or somebody else in the, in, the, in the country. We need to get what we deserve down here in Miami-Dade. And so with that, I'll, uh, that's all I have to say and uh, I'll turn it over back to Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Mayor Jimenez. Uh, we really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And again, I know how busy you've been uh, with Zoom conferences and other types of, of meetings to try and continue to move the ball forward in Miami-Dade County. So we much appreciate it. I'm really excited to have with us as a partner today, uh, Lillian Lopez, the President and CEO of the South Florida Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Lily has been extremely busy uh, communicating all the various resources that are out there and available to help businesses, in particular small businesses here in Miami, uh, to survive this crisis that we're in. And so we're excited to partner with her today and have her share some of the activities that she's been up to, that the South Florida Hispanic Chamber has been up to in order to, uh, to help out our business community. So Lillian, I'll turn it over to you.
So it looks like we have a little bit of, uh, of technical difficulty with Lillian. We'll get her on a little bit later. So why don't I move to uh, John Carpenter uh, and Danielle DeSonia. Uh, they are both uh, members of the Cherry Beckert uh, accounting firm. And they're here to provide some detail and a presentation uh, that they'll walk you through some of the challenges that we know uh, small businesses, 1099 uh, consultants and, and, and other individual uh, workers, gig economy workers are up against. And so uh, I think we have a slide presentation that's ready to go. So Maria, would you tee up the slides? Hey, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, John. Excellent. Uh, well, we, uh, we appreciate the mayor's support and all the other organizational support. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on with CARES Act. Uh, I, I think you, uh, most business owners would probably have to have been living in a cave for, for the last two weeks to have not heard about it. Um, we've, we've been, I think we, everyone in the public accounting and the banking profession and the lending business have been bombarded with questions and uh, from, from businesses of all sizes. And, and probably, hopefully as most people are aware, you know, the window for applications from small businesses set up as S Corps and LLCs, C Corps, uh, that went last Friday. Uh, feels almost like a lifetime ago, but it was really only a few days ago. And, um, and per the statute, per the CARES Act, the window for applications from uh, sole proprietors and 1099s opens tomorrow. And, uh, and I'm going to trust that, that our, our lender in the group can talk a little bit about uh, just the, the pipeline that's developed out there and, and, uh, and how that seems to be working. Um, so under the CARES Act, uh, and, and Danielle and I have been busy fielding hundreds and hundreds of questions, as have um, virtually every other professional in our firm. Uh, many employers have been asking us over and over, um, from the employer side, are 1099 individuals included in their calculation of eligible payroll? And, and the answer has, we've been consistently saying, no, uh, payroll for an employer is counted based on W-2s. 1099 individuals need to apply on their own. And so that window opens tomorrow for them. So let's... Uh, skip a slide here. We put a couple of definitions in here. Um, so what is, what is an eligible self-employed individual under CARES Act? And I'm not going to read this to you, but, and we will have the slides available, but this tells you, uh, you know, an eligible self-employed individual, someone who's conducting a trade or business um, uh, and would be entitled to paid sick leave under the emergency paid sick leave act if they were an employee of an employer, somebody other than, other than themselves. Um, I, I must confess one slide, we, as, as we took a slide presentation that we've used for businesses and scaled it down because there's a lot of things applying to um, multi-employee employers that don't apply here. Uh, admittedly, one slide we, we inadvertently pulled out was but I think everyone's aware of it, is to, to let you know. So how much are you as a 1099er, how much, or a sole proprietor, how much are you eligible to borrow under PPP? Uh, you may have read, I mean, the max is $10 million. Uh, no one who's a 1099 can come anywhere close to that. But you're eligible to borrow two and a half times the, the average monthly payroll as, as defined, which we'll talk in a second, two and a half times the average monthly payroll. And you have the choice of either averaging that out based on earnings in calendar 2019, January 1 through 12, 31, 19, or a rolling 12 months. And based on the regulations we've seen, we think you could probably either go rolling 12 through end of February or through end of March. <clears throat> what documentation? you have to put together. <clears throat> it's really 
it's really going to be based on tax documents. Um, if you're a sole proprietor, it's going to be based on your Schedule C. If you're a 1099, it's going to be based on your 1099 miscellaneous forms. Um, that's largely what you're going to put together. And, um, I think everyone in our profession is, is pivoting to look at the details of this. We've been very involved in the details of what S Corp, C Corps, and LLC are required. Um, over the next few days, we're all going to be pivoting to look at, at what 1099ers need to provide. But we think it's fairly simple. Um, it basically comes down to self-employment income. And I know um, in terms of the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, and we'll talk, I'm sure that our, our lender participant will talk more about this uh, in terms of, you know, who's eligible. It's basically running through banks and non-bank uh, SBA approved lenders in the 7A program. Um, and, and, and 1099ers uh, do apply individually, not in groups. And Danielle, I'm going to kick it over to you for to kind of go from there. All right. So John kind of talked about that front end when you're applying for the loan. You know, how do I do it? Who, how much is eligible to, uh, to be included in that calculation? So once you get the loan, what can you use it for? Um, obviously, the whole purpose of the program is payroll. So you can use it on your own payroll costs. Um, obviously, with this group, it's just going to be yourself. Uh, you can also use a portion of it for other things like rent, uh, utilities, and mortgage interest if that agreement was in place before 215. And I think that's going to be an important distinction. So when you are applying, there are certain good faith certifications you have to make. Um, you know, the bank is going to still do some underwriting, but you need to certify that you are economically injured or harmed by this whole situation um, that we're in right now. Another one is that the information you provide is correct and accurate. Um, that's a big one. I don't know amount of the you know penalty is but it's it's big <laughs> um, another thing I want to point you to here is you can do the EIDL loan and the PPP loan but they cannot be used on the same cost so that'll take some planning on your part um, making sure that you have enough costs to cover both loans otherwise you need to roll that EIDL loan into the PPP um, as we stated you can apply tomorrow um, I guess it's bank by bank or lender by lender who will be open and ready for you. Um, some key loan features, the interest rate has jumped around a lot, but it's been at 1%, I think, since at least last Friday when the other businesses could apply. And then one key item is that no collateral and no personal guarantee, which is big um, for sole proprietors. So we kind of already went over what's included, and that is what can be forgiven. Um, again, the payroll costs need to make up a good chunk of that, but you can also use it to cover some utilities, rent, and mortgage interest. Again, if it was in place before 215, and that other chunk of expenses can be up to 25% of your total amount. So I want to keep it short because I know we have a lot of other presenters, but you know the next slide um, or the last slide has our contact information, and I'm sure you'll get all that. If you have any questions, we are. Here to answer. Turn it over to, are we jumping back to um, Ms. Lopez? We'll jump, back to, we'll, we'll jump back to me, Danielle. Okay. Uh, I think Lily Lopez. I'm here. Now. I think okay, so. I think Lily has joined <laughs> us. Hi, Lily. How are you? Hey, oh, I can see you finally. I'm so sorry. You know that it, I live in Miami Beach and we've had problems with both AT&T and Atlantic Broadband. So internet was down. Oh my Don't worry God. about it. Don't At least I was able to connect through my phone. So I'm, I apologize for this. Oh so God, you're, it's crazy. You're, li you're live right now with about a thousand participants oh. that want to hear from the business community and from the I'm South so Florida Hispanic awesome. Chamber of Commerce. So you now have the, the platform. Oh gosh, thank you so very much. And I, I'm, it's, I'm honored and privileged to be part of this fantastic panel. And uh, it's been very hard for our businesses because obviously we know Miami-Dade County has like approximately 82,000 small businesses. And of those, at least half of them have only one to four employees. And many of our members are like that. You know, they're small, you know, mom and pop shops. And of course we have the big companies, the banks and, the, you know, the airlines and the cruise companies, as all of we, all of us have who work in chambers of commerce or, or like you in the um, 
Beacon Council and we, so we need the support of the big companies, but the little ones are maybe like, I see them as our babies. Those are the ones that need to be nourished and we need to take care of them. And we're seeing, and we're seeing a lot of our members that are really, you know, overwhelmed. They're going out of business. Unemployment is like hitting the roof and uh, we don't know what is going to happen. So there is a lot of uncertainty within our membership as to what's going to happen. And that's what I get, that those are the main concerns that I'm getting from them because they don't know if they're gonna be able to hold on and what's gonna to happen to them. So the most that we can do is of course, provide them resources such as what you're doing today. And we're doing a webinar also for our members on, on Monday. But uh, other than that, we have to, uh, what I'm trying to do is provide like a positive message because I know that this country is the strongest and most powerful nation in the world. And we have the best scientists, we have the best doctors, and I know that this eventually will go away. And when we really take off, I know it's going to be big time. I know it's gonna take a lot of effort, a lot of work, but the human capital of the United States of America is so strong, so, so strong that I know. And we've, and we've been, this is like a punishment. And you know what, this has made us realize how dependent we are on one another. And I've noticed something, and I don't know if you all have noticed, but when I take walks, I see people smiling at me and saying hello. I mean, I always say hello because I'm a friendly person. So I'm overly friendly. But I remember walking all the time and people not even looking, making eye contact. And now I see that, that people are looking at you saying hello. People are more united than ever. And it's a human capital that is gonna make this country go back on its feet again, and we're going to be successful and make it. We don't know when, but we know that we will do it. And that's what I'm telling my, my business on um, our members. And the community in general, anybody who's not a member is also welcome to, to join us and to see all the webinars and everything that we're doing. And we are focusing a lot on the psychological aspect, and we're having also a webinar on that with a PhD, because as you know, Mike, and all of you and the people who are listening to us, we're not used to being home. I mean, me, for one, I mean, I'm always out and about. I'm going, I'm going at a 200, 300 miles an hour, like many of us, we don't hardly even cook women, right? So nowadays we have to cook, we have to be at home, we have to clean, we have to do laundry, and then we have to do the work, right? The work from the office, home, virtually. So in reality, we're working harder than before. So psychologically, imagine people, and we have a lot of members that are younger and they have children, and the children are at home and they're doing school virtually. And at the same time, they have to deal you know, with the husbands and with the cooking and the cleaning. So that creates a lot of stress. And eventually that is a problem for when we all go out to work again, because everybody's so overwhelmed with all the, the negativity of all the news and everything that we're hearing. So that's a very important component here. The psychological uh, aspect, the mindset, how people are coping with this. And I think that is not being mentioned so much as it should because that could create a bigger problem eventually so we're looking at that too as a, as a chamber of commerce and just providing all those resources to to the members and basically just trying to hang on there and be positive and that's like my message um mike to all of you and to all of the people who are listening and to my wonderful colleagues i know we have we have um um, Bernie Navarro, whom I'm saying hello to because I came in late, and uh, all of you who are, are part of the panel, and also my, my friend from the Many Day Chamber, whom I love and adore. Eric, how are you? So basically, that's, that's my message, that we're, I'm very concerned about the small business. I'm very concerned about the fact that many, uh, the majority of the people in Miami-Dade County, like 30% of their salary goes for their rent. So how are they gonna hold on? So this is just a trickle down effect. And we see the, the tourism industry completely destroyed. And I was seeing in the, no, in, the, in the news today, United Airlines and all the airlines, one third of the fleet, of, of all their, their planes are parked, and it just broke my heart. So just seeing that in the cruise industry and how well we were doing and how we are completely at a stop, how that hurts us. But again, I say that we, we're still trying to send a message of, of being positive and we're, we have the human capital, we have the sciences, and I know that we, we will overcome all of this. Thanks, Lily, and we really appreciate mm -hmm. your insights and uh, please stay safe. Uh, sure, with that, absolutely. I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Knowles, uh, President and CEO of the Miami Day Chamber. Uh, Eric also represents a significant portion of our small business community, and we want to make sure that he has an opportunity to speak to his membership. Eric, it's up to you. Eric, I think you're on mute, so you need to unmute.
I'm sorry, Mike, we're having trouble getting Eric and Matthew, were you going to speak or we can move on and try to get Eric on after? Yes, uh, I, I can't speak um, if he's having a tick of technical difficulties at now. Um, first of all, um, thank you, uh, Beacon Council, Miami-Dade County, everyone that has organized these workshops um, for business owners um, and businesses throughout Miami-Dade County. Um, this is something that is much needed and much respect for all the business owners that have um, taken the time to try and figure this out. Um, we at the Chamber, Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, um, is it, mostly taking the time to really, uh, like many of our businesses um, and chambers, is help trying to figure this process out and help our members uh, step by step. We do, um, like the Hispanic Chamber, we have a lot of small mom and pop shops um, that have under um, five employees. Um, and many times with, with the latest details that are coming out, um, they're at the, the tail end of getting these uh, services. Um, so we are able to provide uh, technical assistance, one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations for um, businesses throughout Miami-Dade County. So please um, go to our website to find out more about that uh, so that we can provide that. And we also have a microloan program um, where we're able to provide um, loans. It is not SBA and we encourage everyone to um, take full advantage of the SBA, the Florida Bridge loans, um, and apply for everything um, and then once you get approved based upon the terms that you receive you can pick and choose which one is best for your business and what you are doing but it's very important that everyone takes the time to uh, submit their applications uh, because it is very difficult right now through uh, banks and the SBA uh, many institutions to try and get an application in but those who get the application in um, have a much better shot of getting a response and assisting than anyone else. So we encourage all business owners, no matter what, um, apply, apply, apply. Uh, make sure you have a quality um, application in, in with all your documentation, including your finances and some taxes. Um, and if you need any assistance, Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce is there to assist. So feel free to visit our website, um, m-dcc.org. Um, and I will leave any other comments for um, our president, um, Eric Knowles, once he gets back on board. So I wanna thank again, uh, Mr. Finney and um, Mayor Jimenez and everyone for providing this platform so that our businesses um, can get that information. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Matthew. So we had an opportunity to get uh, a high-level overview from John Carpenter and Danielle Desonia uh, in terms of the framework for the CARES Act and PPP. And we now have Kara Warwick, who's a partner with Holland and Knight, to take a deeper dive into the CARES Act and the existing SBA programs that are available for sole proprietors, gig economy workers, et cetera. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Kara to walk us through a deeper dive. Hi friends, this is Kara Ward. Um, are you guys able to, to hear me? Hi guys, Hi guys are, you, are you able to hear me? Yes. Oh, oh good, good. Great. Great. Let's uh, uh, okay, okay. So some of the, the information that I'm gonna cover was already covered a little bit earlier, but I'm gonna be able to zoom through a couple of these slides so that you have something in front of you um, to look at. And I think some of the, the friends on the other line or the, the back end here will help me advance the slide. So let's get into um, slide two here, what we're gonna be talking about. Um, I'm gonna go over what's happening in the CARES Act and we can get also into a little bit of what's going on with the payroll protection program with a bit of a deeper dive on 1099 gig workers and sole proprietorships. And then I wanna give you a preview as someone who's a lawyer and a lobbyist um, in DC what's coming through and what you can what you're able to, to significantly um, separate the the noise from the signal here uh, from what's happening in congress today all right so moving to slide three um the cares act was the the piece of legislation that was passed on um, march 27th and the basic provisions that i think you guys want to look at is the unemployment insurance some of the tax provisions um, personally in, in your own you know, family balance sheet, looking at the mortgage loan deferrals, and then of course the small business programs. Now you guys have already seen this slide here on four, um, slide number four that goes through the definitions of who is who. Um, importantly, the eligible self-employed individual will include gig workers who pay their taxes. If you are sort of 
a little bit behind or, or not disclosing as much as you normally would, um, that, that would be a little bit of a disadvantage for you. But um, keep in mind that it's all of your back end sort of um, compliance requirements are going to be traced back very likely to your tax statements. Um, also, there's a distinction in the tax law and under um, the actual provisions of the PPP program, the Payroll Protection Program, um, that says sole proprietors can apply now. They could have applied a little bit earlier in, in, in the um, process, but 1099 and independent contractors and gig workers need to wait until tomorrow. Moving on to slide number five. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the unemployment insurance provisions that are in here. So typically, if you're considering yourself a self-employed individual, um, unemployment insurance is not going to be available for you. Um, freelancers are more likely to take advantage of the unemployment insurance, while self-employed and sole proprietorships and independent contractors are going to be taking advantage of the payroll protection act. Um, so you have an option to arbitrate the two, and probably it may be in your best interest to um, calculate you know, where the, the, the meteor benefit is for you. Um, here we are with 39 weeks of unemployment, uh, but first you have to be denied for regular unemployment insurance by your state. This can be a lengthy situation. We know in some states, um, like Georgia, they just told the independent contractors to go home that they, have, they don't have any forms for them and they won't be rejecting any applications. I'm not sure how things are going in Florida, um, but I'd be glad to answer some questions about it if we have um, Q&A time. But you'll see here, um, and this slide will be available for you to, to look at afterwards, or you can email me and I'd be glad to share it with you, um, a little bit of the process and the resources that are available under unemployment insurance. Moving on to number six, I wanted to show you guys um, some of the other um, situations that are available to you. If you haven't filed your taxes already, you'll have until July 15th. Um, also, you'll, many, many of the folks on the phone, if they qualify, should be able to uh, take advantage of the taxpayer, the direct payments, which is about $1,200. And then last, I wanted to go over, um, if you have a loan that's backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or FHA, and there's a way to look it up. Um, if you Google who owns my loan, you're going to get to a website that will ask for your address and they'll tell you if it's federally backed. You're entitled to up to a year of payment deferral. Um, and that's different than forgiveness um, and a little bit different than what most people are overusing the word forbearance. But the way that I've seen it play out for a fair number of uh, the clients and the banks that I advise on how they're putting together the programs, it looks like most borrowers will qualify or just a, a deferment, meaning that the principal and interest gets tacked on to the end of the mortgage, but your loan isn't recapitalized, so you're not actually um, owing additional interest expense. Now that's the ideal situation, but we've been hearing some um, lenders are being a little less generous and requiring um, a balloon payment at the end of the, the forbearance period, meaning you have to make up all of the mortgage interest and principal that you've deferred for the period of the deferment. And that's going to be tough because that could come due in three months or six months and that will force you to refinance your mortgage maybe into a less advantageous interest rate. But stay tuned. I think um, when I talk a little bit later about what's coming next, um, Congress may try to protect um, mortgage um, mortgages for these folks. And if you're anything like the, the independent contractors and friends I know, mortgage expenses is one of the largest um, things on my family's balance sheet. So if you have questions about that, I'm also happy to walk through a little bit of, of what you can expect when you request one of these forbearances. Um, I think I just duplicated the slide here in my deck, um, but moving on to slide seven. Here we go, great. Um, here in the CARES Act, um, as someone who considers themselves their own business, uh, there's really two provisions and two uh, programs you can participate in that were expanded eligibility under, um, under the legislation. So the first is we've talked a little bit about the Paycheck Protection Program. And the benefit, moving on to number eight, is that it's a forgivable loan um, should you decide to be able to use the, the funds on uh, purposes that are considered forgivable under the guidance and the statute. Um, a lot of these one through seven may not be very helpful for you until you get down into your obligations as a 1099 um, or sole, sole proprietorship to pay state and local taxes. Um, but have a look at, at this qualification um, 
slide as you start to fill out your documents for tomorrow. Moving on to slide nine, um, here are some of the other requirements. You need to be located in the United States, meaning have a permanent address in the US and been in business as of the 15th. Um, and most of this information is self-certified, meaning um, you're gonna bring it to your bank and your bank will probably have limited to very little um, uh, documentation requirements that are required by statute, but your bank may start to require certain things for you to bring in like old tax returns. The legislation that's pending in Congress today is supposed to give your banks and you more of a preview of what they're expecting you to bring in. And they include things like a driver's license, um, last year's taxes, and um, some other expenses. Keep an eye on the legislation that gets passed today. And I know a lot of you are not familiar with how to read legislation and why should you? It's actually a terrible job, which is what I do for a living. <laughs> but um, if you go to the Holland and Knight website, we'll have a summary for it as soon as it passes. And we hope to be helpful to you guys in that way. Um, and then I have the last bullet here. Um, a prudent applicant is gonna make sure that you can document everything that you're asking for. Because the penalty isn't just that you're gonna have to give back the money, it's possible you could face prosecution for lying to the government under the False Claims Act and then be responsible for paying back three times the money and being barred from ever being able to take out a loan like this again. All right, let's go on to slide 10. Um, here's a couple more bullet points to keep in mind when you think about the Payroll Protection Program. Um, importantly, the last bullet here, which is you can take advantage of two of these SBA programs, and it's the second one, sometimes known as EIDLs, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Programs, that um, independent contractors are generally unaware of or not familiar with their ability to take advantage of it. Now, unlike the Payroll Protection Program, which has some friction um, in going in and finding a lender who's willing to, to take your application if you're not already a business lender with them, um, the idle loans, you can apply directly on the SBA website. So let's skip over to um, slide number 11. Um, that's a little bit more on the Paycheck Program, but let's go to slide 12, if we can, 12. 13, talked about forgivable. Um, here we go, number 16. Let's go to 16 if that's possible. Um, I wanted to make you guys particularly aware of this, that sole proprietorships and independent contractors are eligible here. But what's interesting is gig employees are typically gonna be excluded from this. So while the CARES Act created permissions um, under the Payroll Protection Act, and then in previous legislation, on things like unemployment insurance and um, and the the family's first coronavirus legislation talks about eligible self-employed to include gig workers. This one does not. Um, but if you file a 1099 or um, or file the paperwork to be a sole proprietorship, you're able to request up to two million dollars. Um, under this program through December 31st, I believe. Thereafter, it's um, I think a $300,000 program. So if you keep keep a big line out, you gotta make sure that you, you repay down to $300,000 or so um, by the end of the year. And here's the, the debts that you can pay for it or pay, use to pay the money um, are similar to the payroll protection program. Interest rates a click higher um, at 3.75%. Um, and the loan term, though, is, is a little bit longer. You can stretch out repayment for um, a little bit longer of a time. Again, you apply for this directly on the, um, the SBA website, and it will shoot the money up. It'll advance up to $10,000 to you immediately that if you're ultimately not um, given a loan for the full amount that you requested, that $10,000 is considered a grant. And you can double up with this um, to the extent that it's um, approved in your Payroll Protection Act. What they want to do is reduce your Payroll Protection Act money by the amount you get from IDLE. So I suggest a good idea may be to apply for this first and then go for your Payroll Protection Act. Let's go on to slide 17 on what's next from Congress. So we've been hearing a lot in the news that the, the payroll protection money is gonna run out. Um, and everyone expects it to run out maybe by the middle of next week if it stays up this pace and includes um, the folks who are now on this call, 1099 sole proprietorships and gig workers. So today in Congress, they're looking to double that amount of money. 
and we have on good authority that this doubling should happen, but there's a number of partisan fights going on right now that I just saw um, as we were getting on the call that the first vote in the Senate failed um, to pass uh, the provision that would increase the money because people are tacking on other, other concepts. Um, this may go into tomorrow, but I do expect that there, there will be an increase in the amount of funds available. It won't be around forever, but it will be around. Um, the other part of this legislation is it's going to open up the uh, availability of these funds for um, community development financial institutions and some other kinds of lenders that will hopefully be more willing to take these applications than we've seen from the major banks and the folks who are already signed up to the program. You guys have probably very likely heard that Bank of America and Wells Fargo and some of the other large institutions um, said, if you don't have a business account here, um, go fish. We can't help you because we don't have the time or the capacity to um, verify you are who you are and run anti-money laundering and um, that kind of background tests on you because we feel like we absorb some liability when we make this loan to you. Even though the government is backing it, um, the loan stays on the balance sheet of these banks. So hopefully when we get to the more community um, and relationship lenders, that the way that this legislation will hopefully open it up, um, you'll find more outlets to go to to get the funding and more funding available um, so that it doesn't run out as quickly. But we do expect for it to still run out. Um, so don't wait forever. Um, not that I have to tell you that. I'm sure you guys are very anxious um, to get your hands on some liquidity. Um, today, um, just about 30 minutes before this call started, um, onto the next bullet point here, Main Street Lending Program. Um, this program just came out. If you're having a hard time figuring out um, how to take advantage of the payroll protection program or the idle loans, um, you can also go through this Main Street Lending Program. I'm looking at the program details right now, and you, if you apply for a payroll loan or the idle loans, these SBA programs, you're not um, prohibited from also applying for the Main Street Lending Program, but I've got to give you a big warning. The minimum loan size is $1 million. Um, so that's sort of making it pretty much impossible for most independent contractors to take out that amount of money um, based on what they believe would be their COVID-related impacts. It'd be hard to document that you're losing out on a million dollars worth of um, financial activity between now and um, I believe it's September. So I had hoped that this program would be more forgiving when I made up the slide last night, but it does look like it's going to really um, only be available to the larger um, organizations. Moving on to what we can expect in the next piece of legislation. Um, this is legislation that's going to come together. It's here on the column number two. I call it COVID-4. That's what DC is calling it. When um, after this Easter break, starting around April 20th, there's um, discussion of what the, what the next big piece of legislation is going to include. And I have the list here. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to be more money for small businesses because the, the money's already been made available. So the only things that we can expect to be immediately available to you is Payroll Protection Act, IDLE, and potentially, but unlikely helpful, this Main Street Lending Program. The next legislation could include more payroll money in, in the event that today's legislation that still seems insufficient to meet the demand, um, but I, I do doubt it. One of the other situations that we'll have in here is that there could be a rent stabilization fund. So if you're the a person who also owns properties that you collect rent on, uh, residential properties, there you may um, be able to be assured that you can collect uh, rent from non-payment, non-paying um, residents right now. Um, you may see that your utility bills get some level of forgiveness on them um, if you get behind in them. Um, I don't suggest anyone start defaulting on their bills, but um, that shouldn't be a condition of any future support and just be a hardship uh, test. Um, there may be free Wi-Fi coming through or at least discounted Wi-Fi for a, a significant number of people. We could see a payroll tax cut. So that's, again, more of the tax provisions. If you're self-employed, you're paying a little bit of the um, minimum state and local taxes and federal taxes as a self-employed individual. And then lastly, um, this is more for businesses, uh, but some business liability waivers for people who contracted COVID on the job. Um, I think as an independent contractor, if you're out there still working, um, you were unlikely to probably sue yourself, but um, just wanted to put that out there that that's one of the, the coverages that they, the government anticipates offering at this point. It may include 
may be valuable for folks who consider themselves gig workers um, if their gig has them out and about um, in the city VA. Um, that's what I have for COVID-4. Uh, I think we're probably going to be continuing to legislate in this area through the fall, um, but the, the continued assistance and financial sort of stimulus and plus ups, we've largely seen those come through. Um, so after that, what we're looking at and what we can, I think as a, a Floridian, you can expect and ask of is your state to draw down some of the $5 trillion of money that was made available under the CARES Act to um, provide stabilization and other kinds of economic support that your state can offer. So the state could basically, and here's what I'm saying, the state could pull down money from the Fed at 0.25% um, interest rate or 25 basis points and um, then make a loan fund or other kinds of grant fund um, available to residents who are economically impacted. And already I'm hearing of um, some Florida interest in the hospital, taking better care of the hospitality industry and the, the workers in the hospitality and tourism industry with something like that. But I haven't seen any details come through yet. I also understand that California may be the leader and trying to figure out these sample programs, which may or may not be helpful in a Republican governed state. Um, and I understand that perhaps New York and, um, and some of the other coastal states may be putting together special programs, expecting that their tourism industry will be negatively impacted for much longer than the crisis exists. With that, I'll wrap it up here. And if there's time for questions, I'm glad to answer anything that might be helpful to the folks on, on the line. Kara, thank you a lot for the very informative information. And to our audience, I want to make sure you're aware that all the slides that have been shared by the presenters will be available following the presentation, as well as a complete recording of the presentation. So don't be concerned if, you're, if you didn't get some of the notes. Uh, that information will be made available uh, immediately after the presentations are complete. Uh, next up is Bernie Navarro. Bernie is the founder of Benworth Capital Partners. Uh, he's one of the lenders that's been on the forefront and watching very closely everything that's been going on with uh, the CARES Act and the PPP. Uh, one of the first conversations that I had with respect to the CARES Act actually was with Bernie, where he was giving us a heads up on some of the intelligence that he was picking up out of Washington, especially as it relates to uh, the impact of small businesses and some of the challenges that might exist for the banking community. So Bernie's going to share with us a banker's perspective of what's happening with the COVID Act and hopefully provide some information that will be useful to all of you as you proceed forward. Bernie. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, for those of you who know me, know that I don't mince words and I wanna thank uh, the mayor, uh, Michael Finney, the, the team at the Beacon Council who have been from day one on top of this, making sure that our businesses are taken care of. So Thank you very much for the work you're doing, working night and day, weekends, uh, at all hours to make sure that the information is out there and that our businesses are protected. Again, Bernie Navarro from Benworth Capital Partners. Our company uh, has set up two websites uh, to make sure that the most recent information is out there. There's also a mortgage, uh, not a mortgage, a, a loan calculator on the, uh, on the site uh, to make sure that you know how to calculate how much you are eligible for. Those websites are www.sbabizhelp.com, www.sbabizhelp.com, and in Spanish, it's sbaayuda.com. So thank you very much. A lot, of, a lot of information is out there. Uh, first of all, I want to set the expectations. Last year, the SBA um, funded $22 billion in in loans and we may have lost Bernie. I'm back uh, on. I'm back okay. on. Do you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, sorry about that. Um, last year we saw that there was twenty two billion dollars uh, funded, we saw that $22 billion was funded through the SBA. Now we're asking them to fund $350 billion and today possibly double that amount. So there's going to be bumps in the road. There's a lot of politicians out there saying that, or at the federal level, saying go to your bank, get your money. So there will be friction 
and bumps in the road while we figure out how to process all these loans. So make sure you're aware of that, but make sure you are in line to get the funding uh, available. Um, as they were saying in prior calls, there are three, three programs out there. There's the state of Florida um, emergency loan, that's for $50,000. There's uh, the uh, disaster loan by the SBA, which is the loan we go to when there's a hurricane or a natural disaster. I think Carol spoke about that. And lastly, there's the paycheck protection under the CARES Act. Uh, that loan is for, it has, carries 1% interest rate and it's for 24 months. It is a loan that is forgivable, but it starts off as a loan. You have to come back at the end of, the, of a specific time period and make sure the money went to where it was destined to go, which is payroll. It seems that it will be easier uh, to process and to show documentation for 1099 employees rather than big corporations, because basically if you're calculating your income, your income should go to you and there shouldn't be a lot of questions after that. So it, all indications are that it should be easier to process these loans once we figure out a system for them. But the system has to, um, ha there has to be a good system in place. Mike uh, will allude to uh, later on in the call of how many uh, businesses there are in Dade County and how many uh, there are in the small business, one, one employee and 1099 employee uh, um, uh, sphere. So it is a big number that needs to be taken care of. Uh, one of the biggest uh, questions I get is the payment. Uh, these loans will be deferred for up to one year. The government will pay your interest for six months of that. After that, you need to start paying, but it could be deferred up to one year. Again, it is a 24 month loan. Uh, the other question I get from the small, from the from the sole proprietors or the 1099 employees, can I pay my mortgage? That will be less in play. Can I pay my mortgage since I live at home I, I, and I live and work from the same place? That should be less in place, uh, less in play for uh, small for sole proprietors and 1099, 1099 employees because the pay payroll uh, loan that you will be getting is to pay you so. Technically, you should it shouldn't be going to other places. So there's a lot of confusion out there as to paying of your mortgage. And stay tuned. And on our website, we'll have a lot of information on that. Uh, lastly, um, scams. Make sure that you are you are aware that there's a lot of scams going on. Do I have to pay somebody to process my loan? Do I have to uh, pay a, a commission to process my loan? You do not. The government pays all commissions and all uh, fees to the lenders that are processing these loans. So make sure that, that you don't fall into any traps. I know uh, we could be very industrious in, in South Florida and uh, th there could be a lot of scams going on and, and make sure that you don't fall into that and all, all fees should be paid by the lender. Um, other than that, I am ready for questions. If, if folks have questions, I wanna make sure that I leave time uh, for any questions that are out there. Again, Bernie Navarro, if for, for any information you may need is sbabizhelp.com or sbaayuda.com. Thanks, Bernie. We appreciate the information and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I know we have Eric Knowles with us also. Eric, we're gonna have an opportunity for you to take the first question so that way you can introduce yourself after uh, a couple of slides that I want to present. So uh, go ahead, Maria, with the first slide. One of the things that Mayor Jimenez touched on in his opening comments was the meeting that he had with the bankers just yesterday. Again, we had, I think, more than 30 bankers that were involved. And one of the recommendations they made to us as a uh, support organization, and, and it really was a message not just for Beacon Council, but for all of our partner organizations as well, it was to be a resource to help these small businesses get prepared to submit their applications for consideration. And so we've made a, a major effort to really build out a portal that will allow uh, all of you to get access to the kind of information you're going to need in order to be successful in submitting an application, in addition to general information that's helpful 
in response to COVID-19. The, the website is bizhelp.miami. You can see it here on the screen. And it has a landing page that looks very similar to what you see right now. Basically, we're gonna look for you to fill in your name, company information, email address, and then you'll go right into the site and it'll ask you for a little bit of additional information like uh, the size of the loan in a range that you're thinking about. It'll ask you to uh, identify your banking relationship. And with that bit of information, you'll then get a redirect that will take you directly to your banking institution so that you can go online and apply. But the good news is about the site, and go to the next slide, Maria. The good news about the site is that you'll have an opportunity uh, to actually see a copy of the existing SBA application so you can get prepared. We'll also have a, a chat feature that will allow you uh, to actually get information directly from some of the technical experts that we have in the community, like the Chambers of Commerce, the two represented here today, the small business uh, operation at Miami-Dade County Small Business Center, uh, the SBDC, and so many other organizations in our community that are available to available to provide technical assistance to all of you as you submit your applications. So it's, we're expecting it to go live uh, tomorrow afternoon. And so trust me on that. Uh, it should be late in the day, but we expect it to go live. It should be fairly seamless. You can use it on a desktop, a laptop, an iPad, iPhone, or any of the other portable devices. Uh, we'll be rolling it out in faces. So look for the most basic of information beginning tomorrow and then we'll be enhancing it over the, the coming weeks to ensure that it provides a much more robust functionality for you. But the most important functionality will be your ability to identify your banker, your existing banker, and if they are SBA approved, you'll be redirected right to your banker's website so that you can go ahead and complete the application. If your banker is not SBA approved, then you will be given an option of selecting an existing bank that is approved that has indicated their willingness to take on new clients. Uh, Bernie Navarro was just on. He has indicated that he's prepared to take on new clients. And we'll have many others like him that will hopefully be in a position to help you out given that your bank would not be an approved lender. The other option that we'll have is for us to do some follow-up with your banker so that they can become SBA approved in the event that they're not. Uh, it'll be available in multiple languages. We're, we're planning to have English, Spanish, and Creole available. And we look forward to having all of you uh, get online and let us be a resource up front to get you prepared for the application that you'll be submitting. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, Maria Boudet is going to facilitate the Q&A and all of our pan panelists are available. And Maria, let's try and direct the first question to Eric Knowles so that he can also have a chance to say a few words with, with respect to the uh, Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce. Great. Hey, Eric. I'm so glad you're hey, finally able to get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll let you say a few words and, and then we'll, we'll throw a question at you. Okay, first of all, I, I really want to thank the Beacon Council and Mike uh, for the yeoman's job that you all are doing and pulling together this information. There's a plethora of information that's out there and having a central location for people to go to, businesses to go to is very important. Uh, obviously, thanking the mayor for his leadership and everyone who's uh, out here fighting uh, this, this issue that we have, uh, unemployment, jobs, uh, people not going to work, et cetera. Obviously, uh, our good friend Lilium uh, and the challenges that we're all are having, uh, we're all in this together and together we'll, we'll make it through it. So uh, one thing I want to thank Matthew for chime, uh, stepping in when I was having the technical difficulties. But yeah, we do have a technical uh, uh, portion of our uh, chamber that we provide technical assistance and we will be assisting the Beacon Council with some of these loan packagings as well. And then also, as, as Matthew said, <laughs> micro loan program, which we loan up to $25,000. And we reduced our uh, interest rate from 8% to 4%. So if you are, uh, we have a shorter uh, uh, application process. So we do have these out there if you're interested in looking at that as as. Matthew also said there are a plethora of loans out there 
apply and you make decision what you want to use after that. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Eric. I was actually going to ask you about the microloans, so I'm glad that you touched on that as, as well. So they can go on your site to be able to get the information for the microloan program? Yes, they can go on our site and uh, the information is there. I believe we even have an application online as well because obviously with uh, the social distancing, we are put in place where we can do it online. Matthew is actually we're looking to do Zoom meetings with those people who are interested in applying. We'll assist you through the uh, Zoom in, in filling out the application. Great. So for the group, I have a question from Kia that, um, and a few people were asking the same questions. We tried to consolidate these as much as possible because a lot of the same issues were coming up. So for new businesses that as of February uh, didn't have a payroll company, could they still apply for PPP if they're, if they're new companies? How do they address that from a timing perspective? Um, I'll, I'll say it depends. It depends on how new is new. Uh, a company that was that was formed sometime during 2019, then they're going to base their eligible payroll based on just the, the first two months of 2020, January 1 through February 29 of 2020. If the business entity was in existence prior to January 1 of 19, and, when, and business entity, I'm thinking an S corp, a C corp, an LLC, a partnership. Uh, then they would, then they can use either um, payroll amounts for all of 2019, averaged out, or a rolling 12. But for companies that just uh, opened recently, uh, let's say in the last month, there isn't a, a recourse specifically right now? P PPP, you have to have been in business on February 15th of 2020 to be eligible for PPP. Okay, great. From Monica, we have a question saying that her bank um, is saying that they're only helping people with business accounts and that she uses a personal account as a gig economy or 1099 worker. Um, how do uh, people without a business account apply? Do they just go to their regular bank? Bernie, that's for you, my friend. <laughs> yes, uh, there, there seems you're going to go to your own bank. Uh, again, the banks are overloaded with applications. I had, we had one national bank that told me they started their portal on Monday and on uh, Tuesday they were taking 31 applications a minute for over $5.6 billion in 24 hours. So there's going to be some friction, uh, but you're supposed to go to your bank and get it. We will have information on our site and on the Beacon Council site to, uh, to direct you to other places that will be doing these types of loans. Um, uh, the Beacon Council has done a tremendous job putting that resource together and uh, use these resources that we're talking to you as, uh, as resources for you to find the information and see where you want to go. Uh, the other thing is the SBA uh, website is crashing, so uh, you may not find all the information you need there. Um, I don't know of any other city or in the United States that's worked so fast to get resources out there, so kudos to the Beacon Council for putting all this together. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, I was thinking you may want to comment on some of the efforts that you put in with the banks to try and encourage more to take on some of the clients that we're talking about today, because I mean, I think that's an important step. Uh, thank you, Michael. And, and really, my, my efforts were, and I'm going to make sure that everybody gets the money that they deserve. And so that, that was the reason why we put together that, uh, that meeting yesterday to try to get the banks to uh, start, start lending the money. We understand that there were federal issues, um, but also this forum here, um, I know that uh, the Beacon Council, you, Mike, Michael, have identified the, the issue with the smaller firms, the 1099s, uh, the folks that don't have a business account. So those are the, the, the folks that we're trying to catch that net that we're trying to cast in, uh, today. The bigger, the bigger guys, you know, the, the, the corporations that, the companies that have up to 500, you know, they usually have a CFO, they have, they have attorneys and all that that will guide them through here. It's a smaller, the smaller entities that we're trying to help today. 
And so um, yesterday I was seeing what we can do to help the smaller entities. And, um, and again, you know, thanks to your efforts, I think this is what we're trying to do today. Uh, we are one of the, we, we, we identified this as an issue some weeks ago. And that's why we try, we're, I think we're further along than most cities. The, all, the only, you know, uh, I guess the, the, uh, what's holding us up right now is the ability of these banks to actually process these, process these loans. And <clears throat> if I were a bank, I'm going to process them in priority order, which is who are my biggest customers and on down the line. And so that's why we need, to, we need these kinds of, of forums in order to help the smaller, the smaller firms get, uh, get in line, but not in the back of the line, get in line and get their money because uh, they're hurting just as bad. Yeah, the only other thing that I would add is that we are standing up uh, our, the website that, that I included earlier, that's uh, bizhelp.miami. And through that, there will be a chat feature and we'll have you know, technical expertise along the lines that has been described today with our Chambers of Commerce, the SBDC, and other organizations that can help each one of you as individuals or as companies navigate through to the application process. And if in fact your bank is not uh, supporting the SBA program, then we will offer up some options for you that our bank's willing to take on new clients. I think the most important thing here is patience and persistence. Uh, I think we're gonna find that there's gonna be more delays and, and dropped websites and other things than we want. Uh, but you have to stay patient and you have to stay persistent to ensure that you get in line and stay in line as Mayor Jimenez mentioned. One, one other thing too, uh, Michael, is that, you know, yesterday we also learned from um, the uh, representative from uh, Senator Rubio, that they're, they're rushing to have a second portion or a second, you know, uh, um, amount of money because they're, they know that they're going to be spending this money so quickly that they're going to need a second one. And so our, you know, our, our, our thing was, hey, this is the money that's available. There's going to be more money available. Still, we need to get a line. We need to make sure that we get the money we deserve. I want uh, all the listeners to, to know that yesterday uh, in that uh, banking summit, the mayor and the, uh, and the Beacon Council put together, a lot of the issues were, uh, were brought forth and how we, we can resolve them. We know that the closing feature, the closing uh, mechanism to close these loans, we figured it out yesterday on how to close these loans from the SBA. So there's a lot of friction, a lot of bumps in the road, but, but we will get there. So just be patient and, uh, and we'll figure it all out together. Thanks, Bernie. So one of the next questions that's come up is uh, related to 1099. Um, some folks are getting 1099Ks, for example, from Lyft, uh, versus the 1099 miscellaneous. Are these documents interchangeable from an application standpoint? Can folks still use those? And just in general, is there a, a general checklist that beyond the U.S. Treasury requirements, uh, the standard documentation that is going to be necessary for folks to present and, and actually prove that they've been complying so that they can have the loan forgiven? So the application documents as well as then what's needed for proof. I don't know if that would go to Kara. Um, Perhaps Kara or John. Or, yeah. yeah, I was hoping Kara would un, would uh, grab the part about 1099K. I am I'm I'm not familiar with knowing whether a 1099K would qualify. I'll just say generally, 1099 and self-employed people their their documentation to support their eligible loan is either going to be their 1099 miscellaneous for 2019 or their Schedule C income if they're a sole proprietor. But Kara, do you, do you have an answer on the 1099K question? I wish I knew the answer to that, and I'm sorry that I don't. I'm gonna take a, a, a leap of faith here, and I'm gonna say that yes, I'm, I'm, I'm probably sure that the 1099Ks for uh, Uber and Lyft drivers will be acceptable uh, acceptable because this uh, that portion of, of the law was pretty much designed to ensure that gig workers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers are, um, are taken care of as part of, as part of this uh, load package. Thanks, Bernie. As a follow-up. One other comment, Maria, one other comment on that. 
And the SBA, while they're not on this call, they have been pretty candid in saying, if in doubt, please proceed forward and submit the documentation that you have to your bank and to the SBA, because if it's not acceptable, they'll reject it. You should not uh, decide not to pursue it. As long as you're providing the legitimate information that you have, uh, it'll at least have a chance of being considered. So please apply with whatever information you have. Michael, that's a great point. One thing's for sure, if you don't apply, you definitely will not get money. <laughs> Sorry. Just, Maria, your microphone is not on. I just realized, I apologize that. But building on the 1099 question, and I think that would go to Bernie, um, as well, uh, do they use their gross or their net income when they're applying? The, um, I'm, I have to see the formula, but I'm sure it is the net income that they are. Uh, uh. Yeah, although 1099ers don't, uh, Bernie, I'll just jump in. 1099ers generally, there's no expenses reported on the 1099. So I'm at, at, at the risk of, uh, of having a different answer, I, I think it's just the gross amount on the 1099. Yeah, I think we were combining questions because different folks yeah. were asking in different ways. So they were asking if they take the total of their 1099s and subtract yes. their expenses, or if they just put forth the the amount that they're you know being paid yeah. for their 1099. Yes, I agree. It's, it's it's yeah. I was confusing with the the, the Schedule C. Yes, it's the, the gross probably the gross of the 1099. Yes. Yeah, and, and Bernie, I agree with you. I think it is yeah. on a Schedule C. Schedule right. C is basically going to be the, the net. Yep. Also, keep in mind, in all cases, it's capped at $100,000. Yes, Michael, th thank you. Very important point. So one of the, the other groups that's asked a lot of questions in the chat and in the Q&A has been landlords. And as the rents for folks are, you know, being you know, delayed, what help is available for them as landlords to uh, offset costs for mortgages, utilities, et cetera? Is there I, is that, I was going to suggest that Kara take that question. She did touch on that in her presentation, at, at least for what the next round might look like. I don't, and perhaps others will have comments as well. I mean, what the repayment, hi, this is Kara. So this is a question about what the repayment terms could look like and or, or further relief. It was further relief as far as um, landlords and could they apply beyond the EIDL loans? Uh, is that something that um, additional resources would be available if that was their one income that they were, were landlords and they're not receiving their rents um, based on the, the present situation? Sure. Okay. So um, here's what we're looking at is in Congress right now on the House side, they're looking at something, a $100 billion um, rent stabilization fund, where landlords would apply for funds um, that renters have, have not left paid. Some of the larger concerns are limiting it just to um, renters whose incomes are considered low to moderate income. So if you're a market rate renter, your renter may not, your renters missed payments may not be something that you could collect on um, under this billion dollar fund. Although some folks are working on opening it up a little bit more to um, market rate rentals um, and folks of more modest means. So there's no assurance that this, this will pass. Uh, but the way that it's looking right now is it'll be limited just to LMI, or I'm sorry, low and moderate income renters who miss payments um, as a result of the crisis. So it's another time to sort of work with your, your local chamber and with your, um, your local representatives to share with them how important it is um, for you guys to be made whole, notwithstanding the city or the federal government's um, moratorium on foreclosures and evictions. Thanks, Kara. I think um, I have another legal question for you. So from Maria, I have an S corporation and I'm the only person for my company. I don't do payroll for myself and, and uh, no one either receives a 1099. 
can I still apply for the loan? My company is, has been open since 1998 and I prepare my 1120S every year. Sure, that sounds a bit like a sole proprietorship and I defer to some of the others on this, on this group call, which means that the, the way that you pay your regular um, taxes would be create an eligible basis as a sole proprietorship um, to apply for the PPP program money. Um, it's less clear uh, based on the information that you shared whether or not you can apply for the emergency income uh, or that what we're calling the idle um, loans, but I think that that may be enough of an answer to get you started. Great. And one of the the last questions um, as a is about disbursement of funds. So we've talked about some of the challenges that the banks have had and, and that whole process, but as far as when the, the loans are dispersed, uh, what is that process like? How are people going to be receiving those funds? Um, not sure if you wanna take this, Bernie. Ernie, are you still with us? Did you hear that question? I'm here. I did not. Uh, Sorry. The communication no, was coming in and out. Sorry, Bernie. That once we know that there have been challenges, obviously, with the process of that of applying, but people want to understand once the loans are, uh, once we get through these hurdles in these these next few days, what the actual process of dispersing the funds to the individuals would look like. Yeah. Once. Uh, the, the, the SBA is clear that once you get a loan from them, once you log on to them and, and you get a loan number from them, you have five days to fund, at about five days to fund. We just received funding documents now, so there's gonna be a little bit of challenge. Uh, money should be there shortly thereafter in people's accounts. And then uh, there will be some parameters as to how the forgivable piece happens. Remember, you're getting a loan and then it turns into a forgivable instrument, but it is not a grant. It's not a gift from day one. You have to comply and meet certain uh, requirements of bringing back documentation that the money went to its intended sources. Thanks, Bernie. Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure if you're still on. We have a question that came in for you from a uh, county question. Great. Uh, is the county considering any further property tax ex extensions for commercial properties past April 15th? This is from Eve. That's, uh, that's something that the governor has to do. Actually, the governor extended it to April 15th. And so uh, I haven't spoken to the governor. I'm not sure he's gonna extend the property tax you know, payment. Uh, they basically delaying the payment later on. That would be up to him. That's something that I can't do. I don't have that power. Sorry, I'm gathering additional questions. I don't know if this would go to John or or Kara, but the relationship between unemployment and being able to apply for the PPP loans. Um, if uh, individuals have applied for unemployment, uh, are these mutually exclusive? Should they um, rescind their application for unemployment or does that disqualify them? Um, I, I would say, I mean, being on unemployment today does not disqualify you from applying under PPP. Uh, assuming you get your PPP loan, those, those loan proceeds are designed to reinstate wages, which to me would imply you then have to come off unemployment. But Carol, that side, I'll kind of ask for your input. John, thanks for that. It's still um, probably an evolving situation that will impact the forgiveness of any PPP loan. But at a baseline, if you consider yourself self-employed um, and have, um, you're generally not going to consider um, taking unemployment um, benefits as a self-employed borrower, unless you consider yourself a, a gig economy worker, um, which is eligible for the expanded unemployment support. 
So the answer is you're going to have to make your own decision, but generally the two are mutually exclusive on their face. Um, but with the, the, the sort of complexities of the, the support going through, one of the things to be prepared for is that either one of those, if you, if you end up being funded in both unemployment and payroll protection or IDLE, the other SBA program, you, you may be um, on the back end required to pay back a, a more portion or at a higher rate than what you would expect it based on your unemployment drawdowns. I just saw a, an important question come through, Maria, if you allow me to, to answer. Please. Yeah, there's a question that came in on a, um, if you have to be a citizen or a resident, any corporation, the application clearly states that any, any uh, application has to be owned, the corporation has to be owned 51% by a citizen or a uh, natural resident. So very important, uh, we've been getting that question a lot. We have a lot of foreign uh, corporations in the state of Florida, and uh, uh, that that is a, an important question, and we've, we've been getting that. So 51% owned by a, a citizen or a natural resident alien. Thanks, Bernie. Um, someone was asking if you can submit uh, different or multiple PPP applications um, if you have accounts with different banks or can you just, do you need to funnel these all into one bank? I'm gonna take a shot at that. Um, you should work with one lender at a time. Um, if you have multiple corporations with multiple corporations that have employees, there is a section where you have to state all the corporations that you own and the percentages just to make sure that folks are not taking advantage of the systems a system and there's not you're not double dipping per se so uh, an application has to have every corporation you own and what percentage you own so that is a, a shot at that and what I have heard, um, also Bernie, excuse me, I've heard that you have to go through the bank where you do the payroll. Is that not correct? That's what my CPA said. You can go through other banks if they accept you. There's oh, no really? Okay. There's no limitation on that. Really? But okay. the, right now, who's accepting you is the bank who has your we, account. Exactly. That's what I've heard. Who are accepting other folks. But I've heard that it's better that you go through your banker, right? Your personal banker. Whoever gets us yeah. the money first. <laughs> okay. Yeah, gen yeah exactly. generally, yeah, generally it is quicker to go through your current bank just because. Of course. You go to a new bank, they have to run um, all kinds. Of, they have to run all kinds of diligence related to anti-money laundering, Bank Secrecy Act, New York, which can take you know at least probably a couple of weeks. Exactly. That's what I what we're recommending our members to go through your bank where you do your payroll and you have your personal relationship with them. This is Kara Ward, just sharing that from my experience of advising banks um, on how to comply with the legislation, um, many banks are unwilling to transact with folks with whom they don't have the business accounts, even though they do have the individual accounts, um, because the business account runs through um, what John was sharing about the Bank Secrecy Act and AML, which even in the best of scenarios takes at least a three-day turnaround. Um, so if you find yourself having been turned away because you don't have a business account at your regular you know, big bank, try the community lenders, try your credit unions. Um, that, and I know that the, um, the chamber is also doing a great job of making available lists of, of folks who are willing to, to transact with folks who don't have business um, accounts with them. You may have to move an account around um, in order to help that out, but also look at today's legislation, which may make something known as community development financial institutions, CDFIs, um, which are typically uh, very small community-based lenders, uh, eligible lenders here. And they are going to make the relationship loans um, knowing that they basically have no business accounts or um, consumer lines that are typically available here. They're, they're doing it because of their limited liability under the law. Thanks, Kara. We've gotten some questions from the restaurant and hospitality industry. So a lot of 
uh, these establishments we know are temporarily closed, if they're applying for PPP to keep their staff um, paid, even if they are closed at the time and will continue to be closed during this period, is that something that is allowed or do they need to reopen in order to be able to apply for the loans? Great question. Not only is it allowed, it's encouraged. Yes. It's encouraged. Even if, even if, a, you know, obviously there's, there, you know, virtually all restaurants and hotels are closed to the public, they may be doing curbside or carry out. But under PPP, you can apply, you can qualify your eligible payroll amount based on, you know, again, probably maybe based on your average for 2019 before you had to furlough your workers. Uh, under PPP, once you get your loan, you have to uh, bring back your workers or replacements, uh, put them back on payroll. You have until June 30 to do that. Although keep in mind, uh, the clock for the forgiveness amount starts uh, within 10 days of, of when you get your loan. So generally, you'll, you will wanna bring workers back right away. Uh, if the restaurant's not open, uh, and, and, and Bernie, you can chime in if you right. have better, guidance here, but you know, but honestly, whether the workers are present and just cleaning and standing around or sitting at home playing Fortnite, I mean, I hate to be funny about it, but that, that really doesn't matter. It comes down to wanting to have more people on payroll ready to go back to work when it's time to reopen the business, as opposed to having them on the unemployment rolls and the business owner has to go searching for workers from scratch. Right, right. That is, it's, it's the Paycheck Protection Program. I couldn't have said it better. It is the Paycheck Protection Program. It is the intent of the law to have your employees intact during an eight week period to see at the end of this, we still have our company, we still have the main pieces in place to continue to work um, at the end of the storm. So that is the intent and that is what it is for. And it's not, it's not for any other thing than taking care of your workers so they can stay off the unemployment rolls they can we can pay them and continue and you still have a company at the end of this so yes that that's absolutely the intent of the law if uh, you don't have to even bring them back to work it's to put money into your employees pockets it's also to put money into the economy so that once we get out of this people will have money in their pockets to be able to restart this economy again if not it's going to be a very, very, very sluggish uh, recovery. And so that's what the intent of this program is all about. So it's actually encouraged. Uh, you won't be able to open up because we still have this, you know, moratorium. We still have this shutdown that we've got going. So they don't have to go to work, but put money in their pocket. When we do uh, reopen, then you'll be able to bring them back. And then you'll have a lot of other people will be able to come to your restaurant because they have money in their pocket. If we don't do this, then our economy is going to really suffer. I know this town hall is about um, 1099s and um, sole proprietors, but 75% uh, of the money, if you're a corporation, 75% of the money you receive must go to your employees. So if you, were, if you reduce some of the employee salaries to get over this uh, crisis, 75 must go, 75% must go to your employees. 25% can be used to those other things we keep on hearing about your rent, your debt obligations, your overhead, but 75% must go to your employees. And we've had a lot of, I've seen quite a few questions where people have said, well, I, I, I don't have any, uh, you know, is there a loan program that just covers rent and utilities um, in small amounts? Unfortunately, I think the answer is really no. So, so thank you, John. With that, uh, I want to extend an opportunity for Mayor Jimenez to offer any closing thoughts that he has, especially given uh, you know, some of the needs that have been identified and any uh, actions that, that you recommend for our leadership in Washington or otherwise. We'd appreciate your closing comments and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Michael. I, I uh, appreciate uh, this entire forum. Um, this is uh, very important to us in Miami-Dade County, very important to me as mayor, that we've got to get uh, you know, the relief that we need from the federal government. We've got to get the money into our employees, into our residents' pockets. If not, we're going to have a very sluggish economy coming out. 
And so I, um, I really am encouraging everybody to uh, apply for this loan, carry out the, the requirements of the loan so it's fully forgivable at the end, and then lending institutions to be as flexible as possible, as quick as possible, because uh, today in my, in my briefing with my senior staff, I'm gonna start thinking about how are we gonna feed people? Because there are a lot of people now that basically have been furloughed for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, they live paycheck to paycheck, they may not have enough money to buy food. Uh, that's why this is really critically important and critically important that we get this done quickly. And again, thank you all. Thank you, Bernie, and thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody on this panel uh, for doing this. And we're gonna keep at it until we know that this is flowing and flowing the right way to give our people relief. Thank you, may God bless you all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks to our partners, uh, Eric Knowles from the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, Melina Lopez from the South Florida Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, Cherry Beckert, and of course, Holland and Knight for supporting this uh, town hall. Uh, please keep in mind that there are many resources out there available to help, and virtually every organization represented here has information on their websites, uh, so please uh, follow up wherever you feel appropriate to get the information that you need. We encourage everybody to look to bizhelp.miami. Uh, effective tomorrow afternoon, we should have that website live with uh, a lot of resources and a direct access to apply for the PPP to your banking institution if it's SBA approved. We look forward to seeing you again. Uh, we do have uh, plans for a similar town hall next week that will be focused on the tourism industry and all the businesses affected by that. Uh, we don't have the date ready to announce just yet, but that should be available in the next day or two as we're in the process of finalizing details. So please be on the lookout for that, especially if you are a participant in the tourism industry, uh, because a lot of the details may vary. Uh, with that, we thank you very much for taking the time out to be with us this morning and afternoon. And we, we pray that we all will remain healthy uh, from this day going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. you, Mike. Thank you, everybody.